All right. So um, welcome everyone to the new year vast seminars. Um, before I introduce today, just a few uh, things about our goals for 2023. Um, we are still looking for people who would like to share uh, their workflows. So if you want to talk, and it doesn't have to be a whole 20 minutes, but if there's something cool that you do that you think other people will benefit from as you go about your day-to-day -day work, something about your workflow, uh, please do let us know because we would like to have a workflow related uh, VAST seminar sometime in the spring. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we are starting to prepare the, the next few uh, seminars. We meet the third Wednesday of every, um, of every month. And so if you have a software project that you would like to present, then please go ahead and uh, through our website, you can click on the link to get to the, our GitHub and create an issue saying that you would like to present. And we will, we will get back to you and we try to pair things up such that there's a theme for each week. And so once we find the right place, we will, uh, we will go ahead and accommodate you. All right, with that business out of the way, um, I am very happy that today we have two talks focused on MESA, the MESA Stellar Evolution Code. Um, and uh, we're first gonna hear about MESA itself, from Frank Timmons, who is one of the main developers of MESA. And then we're gonna follow up and hear about the TULIPS package for very cool visualizations of MESA output by Ava Laplace. So let's start with Frank. Frank, you should be good to go. Uh, all okay. oh, right, and uh, if you have questions, post them in the chat. We're gonna do 20 minutes and then 20 minutes talk, and then we're gonna use the remaining 20 minutes to handle questions about both packages. And Catherine will handle the questions. So Frank, take it away. Okay. Screen share. <laughs> good. Yep, you're good. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be talking about the Mesa project today. And I am going to start off with a proposition and I will take it from there. Okay, here we go. Stars are great, really. And that means that we need good models of them. And MESA is a software instrument that models the evolution of stars. And MESA stands for Modules for Experiments, Experiments in Stellar Astrophysics. Okay. Oh, and did I say stars? What I meant to say was single and binary stars, planets too, explosions pulsations, and so much more. Okay, MESA has a lot of capability. Uh, and the MESA source code itself is a set of modules that can be used by others or combined with the, to solve the coupled equations of 1D stellar evolution with an implicit finite volume scheme. The image here is one row of the derivative matrix showing the locations of non-zero locations in the matrix. This is the Jacobian matrix, uh, and it contains both structure and isotope information. And that is the most technical I'm going to get in this talk on the MESA source code. So the MESA source code itself has been described or is described in six articles starting in 2011 and running up through from MESA 1, MESA 2 in 2013, MESA 3 in 2015, MESA 4 in 2018, MESA 5 in 2019, and new for 2023 is MESA 6. I just got the proofs about two days ago, so we're going through the proofs right now, and that should be published very soon. So I would like to remark here that uh, publishing six articles on a software instrument is in itself an innovation. Okay, this is one of the ways that MESA has innovated. 
I'm sure we all know various software instruments that will publish one article. Uh, and then maybe a decade later, you might see an update to it. Um, and so this innovation of publishing updates as it's moving um, uh, over the course of 12 years here itself has, has been an innovation. Uh, and a highly and everybody who writes software knows that by the time the article comes out in press, it's already behind, okay, from where the source code is. So I highly encourage multiple instrument papers as you move your software project forward. So how's this working? We got six. What's how's that been working out uh, for everyone? Um, and this here is the bibliometrics for uh, Mesa and Total. Uh, and so I want to focus your first attention on the innermost histogram uh, from 2011 to 2022. As you will see, 2022 is going to be a banner year for, for Mesa, um, a definite uh, jump there in the uh, number of citations. And if you sum all those citations, it's currently, or at least as of January 1, uh, was about uh, on the order of 8,000 citations or so. Buried within that, Mesa 1 is one of the top five most cited articles of 2011, top 10 in 2013, and you can read the rest of that list there, you know, the instrument papers in Mesa. And these are all APJ supplement articles. They are significant, large bombers describing the Mesa software instrument, okay? But Mesa is just one part. I think there you can go one circle out and instead of just talking about Mesa, take your bibliometrics and go one circle out and ask how many citations do the articles that cite Mesa get? In other words, how valuable is it to the larger community for the people who are using Mesa directly for their science? And that's the purpose of the outer circle. There's approximately 185,000 citations to the 3,000 articles that cite MESA. And so this gives an impact factor, a multiplier uh, of about 23 uh, for every article that is uh, published citing MESA. So these are sparkly metrics. Uh, they're very good. And who is writing all these papers? Who's doing all this stuff? Well, this community is spread globally. Uh, currently, MESA has a community of about 1,100 uh, active registered users on MESA user list. Uh, that was in January 2023. And every year there's about a 10% turnover as people come, people go. And so if you sum it all up since uh, MESA users was started in 2011, that's about a community of about 2,300. And some people will learn MESA, they go off and then they come back to it. And so it's sort of a fluid, fluid community of roughly about 2,300. Uh, and of the Stellar Evolution instruments that are out there available, MESA by far has the dominant market share across the globe. Okay. So MESA, uh, I think any software instrument actually, uh, it takes a village to have a thriving open knowledge software project. Um, I have played several roles in this cartoon. Uh, most recently, a uh, uh, person with the board and pen there writing the Mesa instrument papers. I have spent a good amount of my time looking at the meters. Uh, so the person scratching their head there, looking at the ammeters, saying, how things go on? What can we do? What can we do better uh, as we go through? I do want to call attention that you will note that this light bulb is battery powered. And this means that every once in a while, that battery has to be recharged and has to be refreshed. And so I think where I am headed over the next year or two is to wander back to that battery crew and uh, work on the battery, get the battery recharged, get a new battery going and all, okay? Uh, and so Mesa, I want to make a particular point here that, that Mesa is just one software instrument in an entire ecosystem of software instruments. So on the top, we have telescopes pointing toward the sky. We've got everything from Gaia to neutrinos with super K with gandalidium there on the right. And it is all anchored by what we do here on Earth, laboratory astrophysics. So these things are like uh, accelerators. They are lasers. They are Z-pinches. They're diamond anvils. If you're interested in hydrogen helium equations of state, diamond anvils are really great. Um, and there's an entire ecosystem covering between what we do here on Earth and what we do when we look up into the night sky. 
Okay. I would like to draw particular attention in this ecosystem uh, to the one here hanging off to the right, which is tulips. And you're going to hear uh, Eva Laplace talk about tulips here in a little bit. And since tulips is pretty close to Mesa, it gets to snuggle right up there, right to the, to the gear. Okay. So there's an entire ecosystem that goes through. All right. So if this was a longer talk, I would meander <laughs> about the past of Mesa. How did Mesa get to where it is? How did it get there? I would talk about the present, some of the successes, some of the challenges in the present epoch, and then I would broadcast a little bit toward the future. Uh, but in this short discussion of the Mesa um, project, I'm going to wrap all that up uh, into a single past, present, future slide and talk about things that people usually don't want to talk about when they talk about their software instruments. And that is funding. Okay. And so uh, this is sort of the funding history of, of Mesa over the last 12 years or so, the reinventions one has to do all the time. So I started out in 2011 and got zero. Failure. Okay. And the lesson there the very important lesson for those of you who are getting software projects off the go is you want to market your community rather than source code. Otherwise, you're just building a better mousetrap. I have a better mousetrap. Yay. Um, so <laughs> who's using it? Who's going to use it? And so you really want to market your people, your community, as opposed to an object, the source code. Okay. So once I <clears throat> took that lesson, uh, started marketing community in 2013. Uh, we generated 500K for three years from NSF. And the key lesson coming out of that was to want to quantify and brand all aspects of your project. Come up with a logo. Start taking metrics. Know what your bibliometrics are. Know how many users you got. Know how many downloads are going on. Really quantify your project. So it becomes much easier the next time around you come armed with much quantitative information. That was followed up in 2017, where we got 3 million for four years from NSF. And the lesson here was that no software instrument stands alone. Okay? You're all tied to somebody, something, you rely on something, you hand off to someone else. So build that ecosystem. As we just saw in that gear diagram, that's my take on building that ecosystem. Okay. Uh, then in 2019, we got something small from the Ford Sloan Foundation, 35K, and the lesson there was roads and bridges. And like all roads and bridges, after a while, they're going to need um, upkeep. They're going to need refreshment. And that's what that, uh, that was basically conference funding to talk about the different software projects and how you keep up your roads and bridges, your infrastructure in your ecosystem. It's 2023, uh, and uh, the future funding of MESA, I'm going to say, is a TBD at this point, and we will see what happens over the next, uh, let's say, year or so uh, on keeping MESA funded. Okay. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and your attention. Stars are great. Thanks. Awesome, Frank. Um, as Jordan, I said, please. we will do a little, we will have time for a more general discussion later, but uh, we ended, you ended a little bit early, so I could take a question now. I went short on purpose. On purpose. Um, it turns out I already dropped a question. Um, oh, so I maybe I'll see. take the privilege of, of asking. Okay. Um, I'm new, say I'm I'm a grad student, right? And my advisor says, hey, check out Mesa. And you, this student starts digging in and eventually wants to become a developer. Mm -hmm. And hey, it would be great if eventually this student could make it onto the author list of Mesa 7 or Mesa 8. How does that work? Has that happened? I'm sure it has. And how would that work? <laughs> Oh boy, great question, Mike. Um, so it was sometime around 2013 when it became clear uh, that Bill Paxton was not going to be doing this forever. Bill is the primary first author of Mesa. 
uh, or has been the first author of Mesa. Bill is now retired for good. Uh, and so that accretion of talent started in 2013. And that's where the idea of Mesa developers came from, uh, was to, to accrete graduate students and postdocs to the project. So that accretion has been continual and it continues to go on uh, up to the current epoch. Uh, these days, as announced in the Mesa 6 instrument paper, Mesa had a very large infrastructure transition and it went from um, uh, uh, basically an SVN repo with a limited number of people to being transferred over to GitHub. So Mesa is now on GitHub. It's a community code. We encourage people and people already have uh, suggested improvements uh, to the code as we go. So the, the, the role of Mesa developers changes a little bit in the era where it's on GitHub and anybody can make a change and a pull request to get something in. Um, so we welcome people to get on GitHub, make your suggestions, go from there. Um, my anticipation going forward is that the Mesa papers are going to be a lot smaller. They're going to be a lot more nimble. They're going to be a lot more um, frequent, but branded. So at this point, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't anticipate a Mesa 7 APJ supplement bomber. I think the era of the big APJ subs is over, and I think we will move into a bit more nimble, bit more flexible way of branding smaller pieces that go into Mesa. A good example of that is uh, Adam German et al's um, Sky EOS paper is a good example of something smaller, more nimble, more focused. Uh, but we welcome all grad students, all postdocs to get on GitHub, join the conversation, join Mesa users, um, and we go. How's that? Is that good? Yeah, that's good. I, I, I'm familiar with Adam's paper, and I'll defer my my Fortran questions to, to later, maybe. <laughs> all right. Um, I think what's best... Oh, please, Alex. There's another, there's another question in the chat. Oh, there's another question in, uh, from Catherine. Was, yes, it was my question, although I don't know if we wanted to move on. I was just wondering, so I'm uh, applying to PhD programs right now, and I'm interested in stars that break our current models and the assumptions we make. Um, and so I was wondering if there are any members of the greater ecosystem that you were talking about, or if Mesa has considered this, um, that take into account kind of stages in stellar life cycles or events that can't be modeled one-dimensionally? Sure, there's a lot of effort on that. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so there are there are clearly some physical phenomena that are, that are clearly 3D, right? Convection, magnetic fields, among others. Um, and so there's, there always has been effort in, um, but I think it's it's uh, getting a, a second or third wind here of mm -hmm. how do you how do you take a three D calculation, which is typically done on explicit with explicit codes. So in other words, you're taking current time steps. So by necessity, the total time evolved is relatively short relative to the lifetime of the star. And so how do you take the essence of that three D and convert it into a one dimensional model that is suitable for billion-year evolutions, right? So you're looking for the steady state in those in those explicit codes. Um, yeah, that's quite an active field, uh, and I imagine it will continue to be one, I think, over the next decade as people start to um, learn how to um, better input 3D physics into a 1D code. I do think 1D is here to stay. Stars, we look up at the night sky, we, we see stars spanning billions of years um, over many different phases of evolution. And we need a tool that has that kind of range, that kind of span. And that's why I think 1D stellar evolution for all its warts and, and, and caveats is, is here to stay for a while. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. So let's move on. Um, next up is Eva Laplace, who is at HITS, Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Science. Is that what it is? I think so. Um, 
and she's going to tell us about the the tulips package which is a visualization tool that works with mesa and we can see your screen and you can take it away yeah thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present uh, tulips to this community i'm very very excited to tell you about it so uh yeah so my name is Ivan uh, laplace and uh, i'm a postdoc at uh, at hits currently working on massive stars and how massive stars form black holes um but what i'm talking about now is a software package that i've developed during my phd uh, and published um and it's tulips the tool for understanding the lives interiors and physics of stars so in stellar astrophysics, we can ask a lot of really important and fundamental questions, uh, such as how do stars evolve? Why do uh, they leave behind? How do stars die? And also what happens when there is not only one star, but multiple stars interacting. And uh, tools like MESA are really amazing for uh, trying to understand the physics of these objects. Uh, but typically, when we communicate our findings, we we communicate them more like this, right? Like these beautiful pictures, um, unless we write research papers. And for example, in a in in papers, the way that we would typically show the composition of a star is like this, and you. If you're familiar with the topic, you may have seen many of these diagrams, and then it's very easy for you to interpret what is shown here. But for most people who are new to the subject, it's actually quite difficult to read. <laughs> it's, it's not very easy to visualize what's on here. Um, so exactly what it means for a star. Um, so you have something like the mass coordinate here, um, which tells you basically um, as you move inside a star, how much mass is enclosed in this region. Um, so you start here and the surface is here. And then it tells you some information about abundances you can find in the stellar interior. But it's not very intuitive, is it? <laughs> um, and so my motivation here, um, when I started developing TULIPS, was to try to find a way to convey exactly the same information, but in a way that is easier to grasp for people who are not necessarily familiar with this topic. And basically, I wanted to make stellar evolution more accessible and understandable, because when you see all these diagrams and it takes so much effort to understand them, it can be um, discouraging. Um, and so the and now that we have these amazing simulations available such as mesa and many other codes it's really easy to make a stellar models uh, a stellar model but it's not necessarily easy to really see what what it tells you <laughs> or what it shows you about stars and so my idea was to basically use exactly the same information but transform it in such a way that it would be easier to understand. And so it's a, it's basically a little transformation. So typically you have a quantity um, as a function of another quantity on such a, a diagram. That's the most typical way that we show information um, in science. Yeah, so you could have the radius as a function of time, for example. And instead, now with um, the idea with tulips was to display exactly the same information, but as a circle, because we know that stars are circles, right? So uh, you can show the same information. For example, the radius of a star is then just the radius of the circle, right? Um, and then this circle can change over time. And so, yeah, you, you may be familiar with this. These are typically Lagrangian or uh, your Larian coordinates. Um, and when we do theory, like uh, with uh, uh, with the stellar evolution codes, we not only know what's happening on the surface, like uh, what we can do with observations, but we also know what's happening in the center. And this is when this becomes really powerful. So you can use the same technique to also show what's happening in the center. And this is how you transform this plot 
to this. <laughs> so it's exactly the same information. Um, but it's shown in a way that anyone who looks at this will be immediately um, able to tell that, okay, this is the center, there's iron in the center, and this is the surface. And under the surface, you will have hydrogen, helium, and then you have all these beautiful layers inside the star. And actually, there's also quantitative information here, but um, we can discuss that later if you like. Okay, so that's the idea of tulips. But tulips can do many, many more things. <clears throat> so it can visualize all kinds of properties of stars. Actually, it can apply to anything that is um, described in 1D. So not only stars, it's ne not necessarily lim limited to stars, could do supernovae, could do anything that you model in 1D or star clusters. And um, basically, um, there are a, a couple of diagrams that tulips can make that are standard. Um, one of them <clears throat> is really showing um, the evolution of the star as you would see it if you had the opportunity to sit there for millions of years and see how a star evolves over time, how, it color, how its color changes and how its radius changes. Um, then you have another diagram where you can see what's happening in the interior of the star as it evolves. Um, another one that is something like a Kippenhahn diagram, if you're familiar with the term. So basically evolution of the internal energy um, and mixing um, as a function of time. Um, and you can also compare different stellar structures and that can actually be really useful to um, visualize certain things like um, here nuclear burning. You can just visually, <laughs> you can see that there is a difference between the, the, st the star on the left and the star on the right. And then it can show the composition in this way. Um, so yeah, uh, Tulips is of course uh, software. It's um, based, so it's a Python package that you can very easily install uh, with uh, PIP. It has um, extensive documentation, I'll come back to that. Um, and um, I think it's been pre pretty popular, so it was, um, um, published over a year ago, and there's been more than a thousand downloads since, um, and uh, a couple of users that have also um, published with Tulips. Um, there, it's, so it's based on one-dimensional uh, cell evolution simulations, and right now the way that it's coded is that uh, it's really close to MESA, um, as you've already heard, and it's really optimized uh, to, to uh, be used with MESA currently. And that is, of course, thanks to other software that has been <clears throat> written already, um, and um, specifically the Mesa Plot Python package by Rob Farmer, who is also a Mesa developer. And I think the best way to tell you about Tulips is to just show it to you, <laughs> show you what, what it can do. So um, Tulips is not limited to creating static plots, but I think um, the really the most um, useful output you can get from it is through these movies. So what you see here and what you are going to see in a minute um, is the evolution of a massive star from the beginning of its life to the end when it, so this, this star will uh, explode as a red supergiant. And so on the left, corner uh, of this plot, you have this typical way that we show the, uh, the evolution of stars in this um, Hedgeburn-Russell diagram. And, um, and here you see the visualization with tulips. The color of this star is an appro approximate color of, um, of the star as the human eye would perceive this star um, based on its, uh, on, the, on its effective temperature. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I can show you this movie. Okay, so you see that the star gets bigger and bigger over time, um, and it changes a little bit in color. It becomes more orange, and it becomes larger. And then you can see that the evolution is not completely linear. It doesn't become uh, bigger and bigger over time um, in a linear fashion, but there are more things happening here. Yeah, so that's <clears throat> the typical evolution of a massive star. 
And um, the scale gives you an idea of how big the star is. So this one is about 1000 times as big as our sun. So it's a red supergiant, it's really enormous. Okay, um, and then uh, to come back to this composition plot, um, I will just um, shortly explain how it works. Uh, so I already showed you an example of, uh, of a plot where I showed the whole composition of a star. And here you will see it evolve over time. So this is the composition of a star as it's um, when the star begins its life. And so it has the same composition as our sun today. Um, and that is something like uh, a quarter helium, three quarters hydrogen. There's a, a little bit of metals, what we call metals in here. Um, and all these, these fractions, uh, so this, it's like a pie chart, uh, can be read in every layer of the star. So you will see that in the outer layers, there will be a different fraction uh, compared to the inner layers. Um, and actually, this, uh, these circles are proportional to the mass of the star, actually to the square root of the mass. And that means that the surface area of every element that you see is actually proportional to the mass um, of, of that element in the star. Um, and so this is, this is a nice visual way to have an idea, okay, how much mass is in hydrogen, how much mass is in helium. Okay, um, so I'm going to show you this movie. Hope you can enjoy it. Where is it? Um, okay. Don't seem to have it here. Okay, let me come back. Oh yeah, I got it. Okay, let me start from the beginning. So you will see that um, the, the star starts its life. So it's just like our sun, it's going to fuse hydrogen into helium in the core. So you see this? <laughs> so all this hydrogen disappears and it's replaced by helium. And then helium disappears and it is replaced with carbon and oxygen. And then there's more and more fun and beautiful things happening in the center as the star starts to uh, not only burn uh, carbon, uh, so it's, it burns uh, carbon and then neon and oxygen. Uh, and I think I stopped it there. <laughs> uh, so you can see all these different beautiful processes that typically um, we don't get to visualize uh, with the traditional ways that we look at stars. And so I hope that this can help people um, understand how stars evolve and also um, see, see <laughs> the stars in a different way. Okay, I'm going to come back to my presentation. Um, okay, so what has tulips, uh, tulips been used for? Um, so I, I have, um, of course, developed tulips for a number of applications, including outreach. And that's actually coming back to that question of funding. Uh, so the reason why I was able to develop tulips was because I got uh, an outreach award, actually, um, with which uh, I could hire someone to write the documentation for me and the tutorials and help me uh, really make it a finished product that can be used by people. Um, and this was very successful. So I had uh, a really uh, great master student, Ilse de Langen, who helped me uh, build this and um, in time <laughs> for me to also uh, include this in, in my um, PhD thesis. Um, and I think, um, yeah, so I, I've had uh, a bit of uh, people telling me that it was actually useful for them. So I think this was a success. Um, it has been used uh, for teaching at high school level, <laughs> but also uh, at university level uh, around the world. And I, I am just really excited to see what uh, people come up with, uh, with uh, using tulips. Um, something I'm really uh, happy about as well is that it has been used for research. So of course, in my own research, that's how I started to develop it. Um, I've, um, I've used uh, tulips to visualize the composition of stars. It has also been used to visualize uh, different things like the effect of magnetic fields um, in stars. Um, and yeah, so um, yeah, what I, I wanna say is just that uh, tulips is a software package and um, yeah, I hope it can help anyone visualize uh, the evolution and, and structure of stars in a more intuitive way. It's open source and it's free and has documentations and tutorials available. Um, it can be uh, used for all kinds of things. 
Um, so currently, I've been the main developer for Tulips, but I'm really hoping that I can get other people on board as well to help me uh, de develop it further, because I am planning to make a Tulips 2.0 <laughs> uh, that, of course, as the name already says, is going to be about binaries. <laughs> so uh, the nice thing is, uh, yeah, um, that Mesa and uh, other codes have been uh, really great at, at showing us um, what uh, the effect of binaries and multiple stars. And that is something you can, of course, visualize as well. <laughs> and it's, um, it will require a little bit of work, but I think that would be really nice. And so the biggest um, feedback I got when I, I um, published Tulips was that people wanted to use it for their own <laughs> 1D code and not necessarily Mesa. And right now it's really not optimized for that. And that would need um, restructuring of the code a, a little bit. So, um, but I think this would really be useful to make tulips um, live on <laughs> um, for for longer and be used for uh, more applications. So, um, yeah, I will try to do this um, in the time of my postdoc here. Um, and another thing is that I publish it on Bitbucket, um, which is. Um, which was what was recommended at um, the university I, I was at at the time. Um, but it actually is not as flexible as GitHub and it's not as nice for identifying issues and really having this interaction with users. Right now you can make pull requests and things, but it's not the best way. So if you have any suggestions or how, how to make that transition um, or maybe other ideas, I am very happy for your input. So that's it, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Eva. This is the everyone's remarking in the in the chat just how beautiful the output is. And I remember, of course, as my when I was a young graduate student, first seeing a Kippenhahn diagram <laughs> screaming inside. So um, just how much easier this makes things. Well, quite nice. Thank you. Um, I think what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna turn things over to Catherine and Catherine's gonna handle the questions for, for both uh, packages and of anything, I guess, related to Stellar Evolution software and, and so forth. And yes. Catherine, of course, there's already a few in the chats. Yes, I, I grabbed a couple of those. Um, yes, thank you very much. I was gonna build off of what Michael said. I am currently that graduate student who took my first Stellar course, uh, <laughs> Stellar Evolution course last year. And this is just phenomenally clever. I'm so impressed by it. Um, I personally have a question. You wrote this when you were at Amsterdam, correct? Yeah. Did that influence the name at all? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I was, I really wanted to find a name that would combine like my, my experience living in the Netherlands and, um, and what the software does. So yeah, the first name we came up with was something like pancakes. Um, <laughs> because, and it, yeah. And also we wanted to have something like that is, that relates to the, to the shape and all this. Um, but then, yeah, my um, PhD co-advisor, Stephen Justin, came up with, with tulips and it's, I felt it's, it's just beautiful because, right. yeah, it also evokes this feeling of something beautiful and, and, pre and, and precious and that's, that's yeah, what I, I wanted to, this software also to show. For, for context, I'm at LIDA right now, which is why I was... Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. nice. <laughs> um, but there are some actual questions that I won't take all your time. Um, Michael asked, and you kind of touched upon this, if people have used Tulips with anything other than Mesa. Um, yeah, um, not yet, uh, as far as I'm aware, but I've definitely <laughs> received a request. Um, yeah, so I, I think right now it's not very easy to use it outside of, um, uh, of um, yeah, using this this uh, package from, from Rob, actually, um, that uses the output of Mesa data and um, writes it into a, basically a NumPy array that is um, very handy for manipulating that data. Um, and um, yeah, so, so this will require a little bit more work, but I've already experimented with this and I think it should be okay. Um, it's, uh, and yeah, th this is really exciting actually, because I've, I've been also working on supernovae. And of course you can do exactly the same thing as uh, for supernovae where you resolve uh, how the shock goes through the star and how that changes the composition and everything. And it's, it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> it's just that the, the output is a, in a little bit different format. And that's, yeah, that's a big problem because 
actually all codes have their own format, have their own conventions, have their, yeah, so it's, and most, most codes don't track units. So you need to be careful if that's, if a, a parameter refers to the same thing, but yeah. So the plan is to, to implement this, but it will take a bit more time. Great. Um, and then the, another question we got in the chat for you, Ava, is um, can you show convection or radiative regions together with the composition? Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> in principle, so uh, yeah, for the composition plots, oh yeah, I think I didn't add it for the composition plots, but I had these kitten hand like uh, diagrams and there it's actually an option. You can just say, show mixing true <laughs> and then it shows you the mixing and shows you all kinds of mixing so you can have the uh, rotational mixing or co convection or uh, any kinds of mixing in principle you can add it to the composition as well yeah should be possible so it's just overlaying uh, another little shape on top basically i'm not sure if it's going to be readable <laughs> but um yeah principle can work thank you very clever um we had a couple of other questions about Mesa specifically for you, Frank, if you're willing to answer a couple others. Sure. Um, Michael asked, uh, is there any effort in Mesa to offload to GPUs, either through OpenMP or OpenACC, offloading or using uh, CUDA, C-U-D-A, linear algebra packages? Sorry, uh -huh. that was a term I was not familiar uh -huh, with. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <clears throat> um, yeah, there has been various efforts over time to do offloading of heavy local physics onto um, compute. So there was a little effort for a while um, on the Knight's Landing uh, architecture from, from Intel, and that was ported. Uh, it did run. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't any faster, uh, in part because the Knight's Landing's um, uh, clock cycles um, were relatively low, and in order to take advantage of that, you needed to be massively parallel in order to do that. Uh, and so when you're doing matrix inversion, a lot of those cores just became work starved, and there wasn't any significant improvement. Um, I've had people come up over the last year expressing interest in porting, in particular, let's say the networks over to um, some sort of a GPU architecture. Uh, and so there has been a lot of talk on it, but there hasn't been any um, that I've seen anyway, um, uh, actual source code that will do that. But it is definitely a topic. It's something to consider. I know it's been done in multi-D packages, um, some of the ones you've been working on and others that will offload their, uh, their local physics as much as possible onto a GPU. Yeah. So something for the future. Um, well, thank you. Um, in addition, uh, Austin was wondering if there's any place for machine learning in Mesa or just stellar evolution codes in general. Um, he mentions that converting three-dimensional models to one-dimensional yeah. seems to be a good candidate. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> on the output, uh, people have certainly done machine learning on the various outputs of Mesa, right? And so you write an emulator to emulate that output. So then you can put that in your machine learning and it makes it go much faster, right? So there are people who do this with binary stars. There are people uh, who endeavor to do it with white dwarf pulsations. Uh, and there are many other topics that people have applied sort of post uh, the machine learning. Um, I think what Austin refers to um, there is sort of generally known as physics aware um, machine learning. Uh, and there has been a number of articles, even within the last year of people taking uh, 3D convection simulations and trying to then distill out the essence of it in order to put it into a lower dimensionality model. So that's a very active topic of research. Um, yeah, I don't ever see that, you know, being incorporated as part of the core of Mesa, um, but I can definitely see people, uh, you know, putting the results of that into a module that others can use. Mm -hmm. I was muted. My apologies. Um, I We have a raised hand. Would you like to ask your question yourself? Yeah, if I could. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Costa. I'm postdoc from Illinois. 
Uh, and I have uh, questions about uh, probably some technical parts of MISA. So uh, what I'm trying to do is using MISA um, as models, you know, because it's named after, after models. Uh, and I'm aware if uh, in the future we will have better tooling for building individual models uh, for better integration with maybe C, C++, Python packages. So maybe CMake or uh, something like this, so some, you know, build system to make only models I need. For example, I need only uh, equation of state model, which is quite great, yes, and we could use it in multi-thread. So I really love to use it, but I don't like to build it. And uh, a small follow-up, uh, will Misa go away from SDK? So I could just, you know, install it with my local environment. Okay. Um, let me see. Let's see if I can unpack that. I'm not sure I got a question out of that, but okay. Um, <clears throat> so what is it that you want? So let me ask that. two things. Uh, better building uh, for better, you know, uh, using with C and C++, for example. Uh, in C in C world, yes. So going away from build scripts and make files to some build system like CMake, maybe or Ninja or something. Got and it. second follow up, uh, could we uh, will it be point in the future when we could use Misa without SDK? Yes. So yeah. I just have my Linux distribution, my macros or something. Yes, and I just install it without SDK. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. you know, there are certainly people who do build Mesa without the SDK. Uh, it's for the bold. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think what you're talking about there is a couple of um, uh, uh, potential improvements or potential differences, maybe that's a better way to say it, um, that people could implement, let's say, over, over the next couple of years. So if you're interested in doing that, I encourage you to go ahead and build one and put it up and let people comment and we'll do a pull request or so on it. So, yeah, I mean, and it's easy to talk about things. It, it, once you've actually got, you know, um, uh, a piece of software, it does something, then it becomes a little bit more serious. So yeah, I encourage you to go for that. Mm -hmm. can, can I jump in and comment just a little bit on the SDK stuff? The, uh, yeah, sure. Far there, there is a member of the developer team, Warwick Ball, who has done quite a lot of building Mesa uh, using the iFort compiler rather than G-Fortran. Um, so he has tons of experience and you might, you know, you might uh, get some interesting info if you just like shoot a question out on the Mesa users list and see if Warwick has any advice on that kind of thing. Most mm -hmm. of us use the SDK because it just you know, makes life it's easier. Like, it's I don't easier. have an application where I would want to do something differently. But if you do, there are people who do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and actually, uh, Evan asked a question for Ava um, in the chat that I was going to jump to. Um, he asks, do you have any recommendations or experience to share for best practices when publishing Tulips figures and movies in papers? Um, referencing that he's used Tulips for talks, but hasn't forged into including it in papers yet. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, uh, so I think the best practices are um, yeah, it depends a little bit on the journal, unfortunately, um, if it allows you to uh, link movies or how it allows you to link movies in, in there. Um, so my experience was that uh, with the journal I chose, it was actually pretty easy. Uh, I could just add it to supplementary material and refer to it. Um, and I was, and it's actually on the website. You, if you look at the article online, you can just immediately see the movies below the article. So that's that's actually really handy. But I know that uh, for for other journals, it's actually quite hard. Uh, so unfortunately, that depends on the journal. Um, for plots, um, I would recommend <laughs> to explain uh, how to read it because uh, so actually um, someone who who added a tulips figure in, the, in their paper actually told me that the referee told uh, told them that it was uh, uh, that they needed to add more information because not everyone knows about tulips yet <laughs> um, and so it's important to explain like for example for the composition plots and um, it's not immediately obvious how to read uh, the radius axis uh, the radio axis and so include that in the figure caption that would be important and otherwise, yeah, please put tulips in your papers. <laughs> I would love to see that. And I think um, 
it's in, in many cases actually really helps um, to understand what's what's going on. Like I've, I've found that for, if you look at the nuclear energy generation rate or the neutrino loss rate, it's much easier <laughs> to actually see where, where it's happening because otherwise you just see a bunch of peaks and it's really hard to understand what it means, so. Thanks. Yeah, I just I want to make sure to credit cool. you as much as possible because I actually am using it a lot, it, mostly just for like movies that I can throw in some slides in a talk. But you know that doesn't always kind of filter through in the same way as a citation in a paper or whatever. So you know, try to think of ways to include it there as well. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, unfortunately, like <laughs> these type of things are of course only counted in citations uh, most of the time. Um, yeah, so I, I I think I made it quite clear how to cite tulips. If I didn't, like, let me know and I can change it. Um, yeah, but um, in yeah, if, if it's possible to add it to a paper, it's great. And otherwise, I think yeah, uh, if um, students um, or something can can use it, I think that would be that would be really perfect. Actually, maybe one thing to discuss at some point with Mesa developers. I'm just taking the opportunity now that you're here. <laughs> uh, I think adding tulips, uh, a specific tulips tutorial uh, for the Mesa Summer School or for Mesa Summer School like events um, mm -hmm. will be actually quite nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Takes time though. <laughs> so yeah. Yep. Nice. Great. Um, thank you. We had another question for Frank come in in the chat. Uh, Michael asks, in the Sky paper, it was mentioned that the lack of generic programming in Fortran limited the ability to do some optimizations. We right. found a large speed up by doing this with C++ templating. Is there a path to get around this limitation? Yeah, so I think it was, um, I think the, the issue with the Sky there is, uh, uh, the implementation of features that are in the standards are not necessarily in the compiler itself. Uh, and so that was was one of the issues that prompted that comment in uh, Adam's paper. So it says so in the standard, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's implemented or implemented well. And, and so that's, that's where that comes from. Uh, that's an interesting news item uh, about you're using C++ template and templating. Um, I would say, no, we haven't delved into that aspect um, a lot. I, I can show you that offline, but- Yeah, I'd like to, I'd actually like to see that. Um, basically, if you pass in something that doesn't include the derivatives, the derivatives are compiled out and they never compute them. So, and for a lot of calls, you don't need the derivative. Nope, you just exactly. want function values. And so, yep. yeah, that will speed things up. It speeds a up lot. things tremendously. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, 90% of the calculation is- Especially those logs in entropy, you know. <laughs> oh, well, Mesa is just, uh, you know, it's a big log taking machine. That, that's yeah. what it really is. Um, Evan, you want to say something on Sky? I, I think my understanding was Adam's hope on Sky was that the sort of the G Fortran implementation of its own standards would mature to the point right. of, you know, being compatible. I think the issue is sort of, arbitrary dimension of the auto diff types that, that you know are you know carrying around the de derivatives and somehow it didn't quite work but primarily you know, there was the hope that you know maybe on a year or two time scale it would work yeah it was primarily for the composition derivatives where where we were um ahead of where the implementation was in the compiler yeah mm -hmm. if i can ask a follow-up loaded question um do you find that the fact that it's in Fortran limits the ability to find grad students who are already able to contribute or, or not? No, I would say it's not been a problem. Um, nobody, you know, at, at some level on, on all these projects, you become polysyllabic. You learn many different languages, whether it's Fortran, a little bit of C, various scripting languages, Python, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, Mesa does happen to be Fortran centric, but I haven't seen anybody running for the doors just because you mentioned Fortran. Um, yeah. If I can give my two and, cents about that. Oh, and, I'm sorry. In fact, I, I think one of the reasons why Mesa had such market penetration was because it was in a language that people were familiar with. It may have been a different dialect on Fortran 90 or Fortran 2000, but it was a language people were familiar with. Um, I, I, think I think that's that absolutely true. Good. But yeah. I'm wondering how things are evolving with time. Yep, it's a fair question. Um, at this point, I don't see people running from before the gates because we said Mesa was written in Lisp. 
Um, in my limited experience as one of those grad students, most of my peers who learned C at some point in their education are able to transfer to Fortran pretty easily. Um, the bigger question is when you get students who have only ever learned Python, how easy it comes to translate. But right, right. I'm not the person writing it. So, right. And if you look carefully at, at Mesa and the, the style in which it goes down, it's basically uh, uh, it's basically C programming and Fortran clothing. Exactly. Um, Austin has a follow up for you, Mike. <laughs> um, uh, he says, uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, sorry, <laughs> go ahead. You just want to, I, yeah, a present with optional arguments would give you the same behavior with Fortran, right? Uh, or multiple interfaces with module procedure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I misread that as a DM. I didn't realize it was to everyone. So I responded to him as a DM. Sorry. But no, no, it's that's my fault. Um, I think it will be similar, but you would still have to evaluate those tests. Whereas with the templates, it's all compiled out. So multiple versions right. of the routine are created where it just completely compiles out those, those parts that you're not using. Uh -huh. We We found a rather large speed up when we only need to use function all parts of, of the OS. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll believe that. Yeah, Mike, I understand that you would, right, you're not doing as much computation, so you would get a speed up. Um, I think the I next... guess I was just saying you can mirror the templating. I guess maybe the module procedures is more like the templating, but uh, I do understand that there's a lot of code duplication because you have to have separate routines for each. Right. Oh, 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 I understand. Right. Yeah. yeah I don't want to There's a maintenance that. issue there of multiple. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and in fact, it's a, it's only with uh, C 17 that it really became easier to do. Um, we can talk about that more, Austin. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, Thank you all for that discussion. Um, I was going to give it back to you, Michael. We're at uh, fifty-eight minutes right now. Yeah, uh, yeah, we we did uh, we did well. It was great discussion. Lots of questions for both of you. Uh, two awesome presentations. Uh, it's very nice, of course, to see people who uh, develop packages that work with other packages in our field. So great example of that, and the the figures are really beautiful. I just can't get over how much nicer it is to look at things uh, with your visualizations. So that was a really nice job. Uh, I think we'll stop here then. Uh, thank you to both the speakers, virtual claps all around. Thanks, Eva. And uh, thank you, Frank and Eva. Yay. I'm going to stop recording. Peace out. <clears throat>